Good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents, a new offering on Village TV. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization committed to peace, social justice, economic equality, and a clean environment. For the duration of the lockdown, instead of its usual two meetings a month, Concerned Citizens will broadcast two programs a month on this channel. Our programs will feature films, lectures, and debates on topics related to our mission. We hope you enjoy today's program. Welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents. My name is Suzanne Modell, and I chair the committee responsible for these broadcasts. As our members are well aware, Concerned Citizens' mission statement affirms a commitment to good government. In that spirit, today we are delighted to bring you Professor Rene Van Vechten, an expert on California politics. As you know, California has some unique political characteristics. For instance, policies can be decided by referendum rather than legislation. Incumbents can be defeated by recall rather than election. A point one may ponder is whether these characteristics make California more or less democratic than other states. Dr. Van Vechten will give a presentation that touches on many of these issues after which she will take questions from a small group of concerned citizens. Our speaker was born and raised in Southern California, completed her education in Southern California and works in Southern California. She holds a BA from UC San Diego and a PhD from UC Irvine. Since 2005, she has taught political science at the University of Redlands where she specializes in California politics. Her book, California Politics, a primer, is in its fifth edition, and she is currently working on a manuscript titled The Logic of California Politics. In addition, Dr. Van Vechten researches how to improve teaching and curriculum in political science. Welcome, Renee Van Vechten. Thank you. I'm very honored to be with you today. Uh, I do have to come clean, though. I, I was actually born on the East Coast, so <laughs> my parents brought me here as a wee tot in 1972. So I I actually would love to claim nativity, but my uh, all my kids and my husband actually are California natives for what it's worth. <laughs> and I did start off at the University of San Diego right here in uh, San Diego, where I actually live. And I have a very long commute to the University of Redlands where I have been a, I have been a super commuter to which I've been a super commuter for about 16 years. So I, uh, I have very long commutes, but uh, during the pandemic, didn't need to do that, and uh, luck, lucky, lucky me, I've I've experienced slightly less traffic in the mean in the sort of in the waning days of the pandemic. Let's hope we're in the waning days. All right, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my I've pre prepared a PowerPoint here for you, and I've got I don't know if you can probably won't be able to see me during this. Um, I don't know if you have a preference for that, but um, let's see here. It's either me or every, I think it's every everybody or, or no one. So, all right. So California at 21 in 2021, that is. I figured we could just start there. And let's see if I can get my screen to advance here. What's on deck? Now uh, let's talk a little bit about the recall and then redistricting. I have a couple of links there in case anybody's interested in following up. Of course, California has to redistrict along with every other state. So the US maps are being uh, digested by lots of different organizations. The 538.com project is a or site is a really good place to go if you're interested. And I thought we'd touch on some of the new laws that are coming soon because Gavin Newsom just went ahead and signed 770 new laws into uh, well, in, just sign them all, sign the bills, so you sign bills into law. So uh, we can also touch on some other things that are happening here in California, such as mega drought and our eternal fire season. All right, so to, just to get started then, 
I had originally been asked to address the recall. We were going to try to to have a, a talk earlier this year, just immediately following the recall. But now we're here in December almost. And so I just wanted to quickly go over some of the bigger takeaways from the recall. The first of which is that Governor Gavin Newsom was, as you probably remember, elected in 2018 in a normal election with 7.7 .7 million votes. And he was able to garner about 61.9% of the vote in which, um, sorry, I it, it's supposed to say a higher number of voters actually uh, participated. And then in 2021, Gavin Newsom retained, was retained in the recall election with 7.94 million votes or 61.9% of the vote. And I should say that 52% of the eligible voters was supposed to be um, in the recall election. So that was my fault. I was trying to quickly change a few things at the end there. There were 53 candidates and that is in, in opposition to uh, the 135 people who actually ran against Gray Davis when he was recalled in 2003. So we had quite a few fewer um, candidates this time around. And the top voter vote getter was Larry Elder, as you probably recall. And he actually was able, at, at least among the votes that were cast, now mind you, that was among the votes cast uh, he was able to get 48.4% of the vote or 3.56 million votes. Now, as you probably realize, if he had been able, if, if enough people had actually voted yes on the, or to, to recall the governor, um, then Larry Elder could have potentially been elected with far less than the 7.7 .7 million votes that Gavin Newsom was originally elected with. And that is, of course, one of the reforms that's being considered here as we think about how to, to redo the recall. So the recall was initiated in 1913. Um, the Progressive Party was going strong at that time, and they initiated of course, the initiative process, the referendum process, and then and the brief and the recall, and the recall, as you probably all know, allows Californians to recall anybody in office except for, of course, federal officials, but any state level official or local official, for that matter. So, out of the 179 recalls that have been initiated, only about 11 have made it to the ballot, and. Only a portion of those have actually, I think six of them have succeeded. Um, not many of them succeed. Um, why is that? Well, um, it depends on who turns out and who is really geared up um, for, uh, for going to the vote, right? Or going to the ballot box. Um, there was a lot of speculation that Newsom would be defeated. And that, that speculation started in the summer when a poll came out and it showed that maybe about half the people in California who were registered to vote were not paying attention and they thought maybe they wouldn't even cast a vote. And in fact, maybe it was very close, too close to even say that he would, I mean, it was like 50-50, something around 40, 48, 49 percent who said maybe uh, they would vote to recall. And so this really lit a fire under Gavin Newsom and his team. They were not about to be recalled, or at least they were hoping that wouldn't happen. Uh, he was able to get, I believe at the last count, I want to say $64 million. I mean, I should go back and look, but uh, he gathered quite a bit of money um, and uh, you know, spent quite a bit of it trying to defend his seat. And he didn't have any limits on how much he could gather, right? How much he could collect in, uh, in funds. Meanwhile, all of his opponents were busy trying to to make a name for themselves. And Larry Elder was able to consolidate Republicans behind him. Um, uh, as we know, uh, Gavin Newsom was actually able to pull ahead. And it's really a matter in this case, I think, of ballot access. Because this particular election had very low opportunity costs, that is, every registered voter received a ballot in the mail. It was easy for people to participate, and so they did, right? And so they they could, right? 52% of, of eligible voters actually did participate in that election. And it turns out that um, there, the, the way that Democrats and Republicans turned out was more or less reflective of their registration numbers. So if you go back and look at actually who turned out to vote, 
Uh, it Democrats do outnumber Republicans and turned out in higher numbers. And Democrats weren't about to let their candidate, the person that they had elected initially, be booted from office. So in California, it's, it's really important to know that Democrats really do dominate this state. And yet, even with Democratic registration um, being as high as it is, it's not over 50%. So it's about, and there were more, slightly more people who voted Democrat or who are registered Democrat right now. Um, so it's about just over 46%. But that is far, it far outweighs uh, Republican registration, which is that it's pretty much at its lowest point in California history at about 24%. So only one out of four Californians who's registered to vote is a Republican. And about one out of four is a non-party, a no, a non-partisan or no party preference voter. And those NPPs, if we want to refer to them that way, typically tend to break for the Democrats. And of course they did in this case. So Newsom could have lost had, let's say, all or most of the uh, the NPPs broken for the Republicans or had and had you know voted against uh, Newsom, so to speak. And of course, we expect that some of the Democrats were also voting uh, against him as well, but probably not very many. So, uh, you know, he, he managed, Newsom managed to pull it out, of course, with 69.9%, 61.9% of the vote. So um, I will say that there are lots of other kinds of reforms that are being considered. Some have said, well, why not wait? Why don't we just have uh, the lieutenant governor take over? Well, in a state like California, where we separately elect those two individuals, it probably wouldn't be a good idea if a Republican and a Democrat, different parties, were holding those offices, because it would give one party the incentive to try to recall the governor at, for any, at any point, really. Um, there are other kinds of re reforms that have been suggested. Um, perhaps the, the lieutenant governor would take over immediately. But then it would not go to the lieutenant governor. You would have to have another recall election. However, if the lieutenant governor is in that mix, it gives the lieutenant governor a big incentive not to work with the governor. Um, our current lieutenant governor, Eleni Kunalakis, is, uh, we talked about that actually just after the election and said that uh, the current governor has given her some important responsibilities uh, on different kinds of commissions and task forces and so forth and has let her in on some of the decision-making that happens that, that we don't normally see. And as she put it, well, he wouldn't have any incentive to include her in that kind of decision-making if it really did come down to a, a, a time in which he was he were being recalled and, uh, and she had the chance to take over. Um, so, because voters, of course, would have then have, a, a, you know, some sort of maybe uh, incentive to vote for her. So, and lots of other ways we could talk about um, that are that are also being tossed around. Uh, the, the legislature squandered its opportunity in 2000, following 2003, to actually revisit this, and here we find ourselves in a situation where it really did come to light. Really, these flaws of the system have come to light, which is that any person, any person, could end up being really uh, the top vote getter who didn't run a real election campaign who didn't have enough time in the public eye for their, their past to come to light. Uh, and so, you know, we don't really have a great vetting process the way that this recall is currently set up. So I'll leave it at that for now. We'll keep moving on, but we can always come back and talk a little bit more about that. We also need to talk about redistricting. Um, so when we think about redistricting, um, we, we, you have to ask, well, who redistricts? And, and many of you may already know this, but I'll, I'm gonna go over some a, a bit of facts here. 10 states have a commission that have the primary responsibility for drawing a plan for their congressional districts. And those are, those, I may mention them here, Arizona is one of them. In fact, there was a Supreme Court decision that, uh, that was considered that had Arizona at its center. And because of that court case, all of these redistricting commissions have been validated. Um, in these particular, any of these particular commissions, it may be five members, 
12 members, eight members, 16 members, right? Uh, actually, I, it can be an even number, surprisingly. And all the states use wildly different methods to choose who gets on the commission. In some cases, they're retired judges. In some cases, they're citizens. Five states have an advisory commission that may assist the legislature withdrawing the district lines, and three have a backup commission that will make the decision if the legislature is unable to agree on the maps they come up with. So the majority uh, state of state legislatures still draw their boundaries, and Iowa has a redistricting plan that is just a slightly different that, that from these. They have staff members who draw the, the plans. So redistricting in California, um, as again, came about because of Prop 11, we the people voted it in. And so we draw the lines in California. And in 2008 and later in 2010, we added the congressional maps to their menu of maps that they need to create. Of course, it's the state assembly, state senate, board of equalization maps, and then now, and of course, congressional maps. The goal of that process for, for getting those 14 people is that we need five Democrats, five Republicans and five nonpartisans to add up to those 14 people. They are all screened. Anyone can actually, apply, almost any Californian can apply. And the, the screening questions really do try to secure people who are more or less nonpartisan, um, strong partisans who have donated to, to candidates and have been very uh, heavily involved in their political parties don't typically tend to get to the end of the process. They are all screened and rated by the state auditor. In fact, the first time around, I, I threw my name into the ring and three different state auditors look at your background and they rate you as qualified, not qual I think it's not qualified, qualified, or others are more qualified. And I think uh, that was the rating I got was, well, others are more qualified. So, <laughs> so I didn't make it, but one of my colleagues actually at San Diego State made it to the interview stage. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating kind of a process to go through. Um, the auditors choose 60 candidates. So you can imagine if 10,000 people apply as they did the year I did, and they get it down to 5,000, well, they have a big job because they've got to get it down to 60. Legislative leaders can reduce the pool. And then the auditors will, by lottery, pick the first eight commissioners. And then those commissioners will pick six more until you end up with those 14 people. And then the final maps that they come up with need to be approved by at least three of each of those categories, three Democrats, three Republicans, three nonpartisans. And guess what? We do not have traditional gerrymandering in the state of California anymore. By gerrymandering, of course, we mean manipulating the boundaries of a district in order to benefit or disadvantage any group or person. So it could be for the advantage or disadvantage of a party, an incumbent, a person, a group such as a racial or ethnic group. And all of those forms do take place in many of the other states. So among the various goals of redistricting, uh, there are two kinds of categories of goals, right? One has to do with geography, and actually drawing those lines. And the other has to do with the people who reside in them. Goal number one, and this is of course what we know from all Supreme Court uh, decisions that are uh, in this vein and also laws, federal laws, there has to be equal representation. So as, as practicable as possible, every one of those districts, every district of every type has to have you know, equal numbers of people, all congressional districts have to be equal in, equal in, in population. And they also are supposed to keep communities, and by they, I mean whoever draws the boundaries, are supposed to keep communities intact. Now, communities of interest is actually what we refer to them as. And the question, of course, is what does that mean? And there's no universally accepted definition of what that means. So it could be a group of people who reside and consider themselves to be a very strong neighborhood. It could be a larger group, a racial or ethnic group that tends to reside in an area. And the law requires promoting, and the law in California requires promoting representation of underrepresented or traditionally underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. So you're, especially if, if community of color, communities of color are large, geographically compact and politically cohesive. 
Some areas, in fact, in California and rural areas, such as I think there's one in Inyo County, for example, are protected under the Voting Rights Act provisions, the federal law that says they still we still need to get some of those uh, cleared um, under the or by the Department of Justice. Um, they're also supposed to respect county and city boundaries and keep them as intact as possible. Thirdly, so after this is a geographic representation or representational consideration, they have to be as compact as possible. And of course, all parts must be touching. So you're trying to create the boundaries that don't you know, look very wildly weird. Um, but in fact, weirdly shaped districts don't necessarily convey some sort of, you know, mischief or uh, the fact that gerrymandering is happening. Why? Because if you've ever looked at a map of a city, you'll know that because of annexations, they have very weird, um, oddly shaped Tetris-like boundaries that can actually be not contiguous. And so the commissioners need to take that into consideration when they draw boundaries. And they're also supposed to, in California, nest assembly districts within state Senate districts, but there have been some deviations and there probably will be in, in this go around as well. All right, so the draft maps, this, uh, sorry, so I wanted to ask, you know, and all of you can ask, ask this of yourselves, what's missing from that list? I'll give you a second to think about it. What's missing from that list? Well, what you didn't see was competitiveness. That is not one of their actual uh, criteria. It, it, they're not supposed to draw uh, districts, or they don't have to draw districts even, that are seriously competitive. In other words, it can go to one party or the other. Um, why is it? Well, it's really hard to achieve all those goals and then also make a competitive district. Why? It's because of the way that people reside in California. A lot of progressive liberal Democrats live on the coasts, more uh, conservative right-leaning or right-wing conservative Republicans live in the inland empire or I should say empire, but inland counties, especially those are really along the easternmost border and Northern California. And because of that, if you really wanted to make competitive districts where Republicans and Democrats could equally sort of battle it out, you'd have to draw like, a, you know, a kind of district that went all the way from the coast to the inland to Nevada, which really wouldn't make sense um, because you wouldn't be respecting any of these communities of interest. So just to make, uh, to try to get those balance so that you have competitive districts is a really actually quite difficult thing to do. So then the question becomes, well, what's fair? Well, they are searching for fairness. Um, and, they, and to do that, they have to draw the lines without respect to incumbency. So who is in the district right now, representing those districts right now? Uh, and they do draw the lines to achieve balance between the major parties to the extent that they can. Now, I do offer this. This is from uh, the, the Public Policy Institute of California. If you've ever had a chance to look at their resources, they're a wonderful resource about all things California. They do lots of research on issues and write reports. You can, um, you can actually be a subscriber. So I recommend looking at their resources if you have a chance. They, can, they have actually been following some of these maps and have very quickly put together some wonderful resources. Uh, one of them in their blog is this one, and it shows that the, they've concluded so far, and of course these draft maps in California were just released on November 10th, that the draft maps offer, maps offer a mixed, uh, mixed improvement on geographic criteria. So the current congressional map keeps 33 of our 58 counties intact. The draft congressional map um, will only keep 30 of them intact. So sometimes counties get split up a little bit. All right. And same thing with intact cities. So they've managed to maybe, for at least for the congressional maps, keep some of the cities all in the same place. Uh, and at the current Senate map, 38 uh, versus 35, right? So you can see here some of the, the cities, they've managed to keep some of the cities together. Uh, not so much part of our uh, 58 counties and same thing for the, the assembly map. So it's, it's sort of take one or the other. 
All right. Um, in terms of changes in Latino representation, uh, they've presented it in a couple different ways. I'm going to try to go through this a little bit quickly and not get too mired in all these different graphs. And you can always come back, I suppose, and look at them. Um, but the number of Latino majority districts, that is where Latinos are the majority in those districts, are less listed and they have that kind of orange color uh, of bars over on the left-hand side. When they say Latino influence districts, it means that that, that particular group is somewhere between 30 and 50% of the population. So they're influencers in the, the district, but not the majority, at least population-wise. Uh, the current, the proposed congressional maps will increase the number of Latino majority districts. Uh, the state Senate map, just plus one, and plus two for the state assembly maps. Uh, in terms of Asian representation, will looks like just only in the state assembly map, bump it up by uh, to by one, I believe. And then the changes in black representation or African-American doesn't really change anything there in terms of majority districts. And part of this is because Asian, both Asian Americans and, and uh, black Americans don't have a, uh, huge numbers in the state and are not concentrated in enough areas to make that happen. So what are the partisan predictions for the draft congressional districts? There are uh, at least 20, 20 out of our 53 currently. And as you may know, we're going down to 52. So somebody's going to lose a seat somewhere. And that looks like it's going to be Josh Harder. But uh, 20 members out of the 53 have been drawn into a district with another incumbent. And some of you have exp are experiencing that. Um, looks like Michelle Steele and now Katie Porter uh, are going to be um, possibly matching up. Uh, the new district that's being proposed is here. It's a little bit hard to see uh, in this, but if you look at this map, um, it's and I'm going to try to trace it with my um, with my arrow here. It's the uh, this black line here, and it's going to now include uh, Laguna Niguel, Laguna Hills. It does not include Dana Point or San Juan Capistrano, and then it extends out into the ocean here. So it's the entire coast that is going to be included in that particular map. Um, now, 14 of 40 state senators have been drawn into a district with another incumbent. So maybe that's a good way to say, well, you know, it, it, they're, at least they're, they're trying to introduce that kind of competition. And here you can see the solid red uh, are, are there with, um, there are some solid red Republican districts and then some that lean Republican. And then all the blues, of course, are Democratic or lean, they either lean or are solid Democratic. Um, I, I didn't manage to put a map, a map in here that would be a cartogram which is actually expands those by population. These maps are really misleading because when you look at that, you think, oh my goodness, half the state's Republican. But in fact, as I mentioned before, one out of four people is actually registered Republican. And those that all that red space is really a lot of land. It's a lot of desert area or uninhabited area. And then finally, we get to the assembly maps. 29 out of 80 assembly map members have been drawn into a district with another incumbent. So again, you can see here, almost all of the coast is, is blue and down, of course, uh, just in your area in Orange County, it looks like there are some leaning Republican and possibly re solidly red Republican areas as well. Um, so that's it for redistricting. And I, I thought we could talk very quickly about new laws coming to California. Uh, in 2022, over 800 measures were sent to the governor, 770 were signed into law, that's 92%, 66 were vetoed. So what do we know is happening? Well, ethnic studies will be a high school and California State University graduation requirement. Changes are also coming to state youth prisons. No more youth are going to be sent to state prisons. They're going to eventually close them. And anyone who's sentenced as a youth will not be jailed, but they'll be sent to counties. And the counties are going to have to come up with some plans for how to deal with uh, youth who need to be uh, separated from society, so to speak, and possibly sent to, say, their own juvenile detention centers. Public colleges and universities will, be, will have to provide free menstrual products. Mandatory sentencing enhan enhancements have been curtailed in part because mandatory sentencing prevents judges from taking into consideration mitigating circumstances. So mandatory sentencing has put a lot of people in jail and in state prisons 
for longer than possibly need be. Uh, so some of those changes are being reflected in state law now. Police cannot block journalists from covering protests. That, of course, comes out of the last year of upheaval. And the it should actually, it should say police use, police use, <laughs> that's a mistake, sorry. Police use of neck restraints has been banned. Finally, I, on this side of the screen, I have some more for you. Businesses must report COVID illnesses and it, they have to report to their, and this is all businesses pretty much, uh, not just government businesses, or, or sorry, not just large businesses and not agencies. So businesses must report to their employees within 24 hours if anybody on site in, in, has become ill. Uh, also, go do, we're going to do away with surprise billing for COVID tests. That's now going to be illegal. Restaurants also can continue to sell to-go alcoholic drinks, uh, and they can continue using parking lots for seating. That's going to be, I think, for another couple years. They are also, the state legislature has tried to ban the sale of ride-on lawnmowers and small off-road engines by 2024. Why? Because they actually have been identified as being the largest or most uh, egregious point source uh, pollution of, of points of point. <laughs> they've been they've been identified as being the most egregious point source polluters. And in the past, we have tried to do this. And I, I have to be honest, I'm not sure where this is going to go um, federally, because in the past, Congress has actually prevented us from doing this. They've pre they've passed preemptive laws that have said, California, you can't do that because it will mean that it impacts my state's ability to sell and make, make and sell John Deere tractors. And of course, Congress has the right to regulate interstate commerce. So I suppose uh, that I, I believe that that law may have sunsetted and that may be why California thinks it can do it now. Uh, if it hasn't sunsetted, it'll be challenged. Or Congress, of course, could come in and just try to do it again and say, look, you can't, you, you can't ban the sale of these particular uh, uh, equipment, this kind of equipment. Mental health coverage is going to expand. Um, most workers are also going to get paid family leave. It used to be limited to large employers. Now, almost all businesses will be required to give that. And we also have a state, well, when she was actually in the assembly, Shirley Weber, who's now the Secretary of State, got this bill in there, and it's a reparations for slavery study. In California, there were laws that required um, slaves to runaway slaves or enslaved people to be returned, and so there's going to be a study about whether or not that should happen. And of course, that whole uh, concept of reparations isn't really just about money. It could be, well, if someone were a slave, uh, a former slave, let's say, and own land and that were taken away from that person, could a descendant maybe uh, be entitled to that land now? I mean, that's the kind of question that they're going to be at least exploring. All right. And then uh, because some laws were vetoed, we won't be seeing freeway billboards advertising ca cannabis products. That was one of the laws that was up for consideration to see lots of, you know, Billboard saying, hey, you need to smoke this pot. Well, or or have this, you know, whatever, uh, CBD products. So we won't be seeing billboards on the freeway with that information. Jaywalking can still land you a ticket. Bicyclists who roll through stop signs can be ticketed. That was another proposal. Um, family leave pay and state college university grants are going to stay the same. There were some big proposals to expand those. Uh, if you are going to take family leave, you're going to still be paid the same. Uh, I already talked about the surprise uh, billing for COVID tests and so forth. I think that was just, all right, we're going to skip over those. So, but those, at least those, those uh, few were, were vetoed. Um, finally, I just wanted to talk for a minute here and I have, I'm trying to see what time it is. Um, I have the t a couple of things that we could talk about. We uh, have some big issues in California, of course, one of which is climate change. And what we do know is that we're still in a mega drought and it's contributing to, of course, some of the largest fires we've seen in history, in the state history. In fact, uh, most of the 10 top 10 now that have been the most destructive in terms, both of the terms of acres and structures burned um, have happened recently. 
I mean, you can see here that the, uh, the August complex fire was just a couple of months ago. Um, and most of these are, are caused by lightning. And if you've ever been, I, I'm sure you've all seen lightning storms and, and power lines too are also part of the issue here. Um, power lines that have, where the equipment has not been kept up and fails. Uh, you know, these large cables are strung across um, wooded areas, for example. And some of the hooks that hold them have not been replaced. And as they wear out, those very large cables can snap, break, spark, and then spark wildfires. And as we know, PG&E has been, uh, has been uh, that's been happening uh, with them. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, I know it's, we're, we're, uh, we're well into it, but lots more that we can talk about. So um, there you have it. Um, that's, that's kind of a quick overview of California, what's happening and some of the political developments that are quite recent. So I'm happy to take questions or elaborate on anything that you're wanting to talk about. Well, that, that was fantastic. Um, it shows really uh, being an expert on California is like being an expert on a small country. Uh, Fifth largest right? in yeah, the yeah. world. <laughs> I mean, the huge economy and a huge population, diverse, uh, every issue that you can imagine. Um, so I, I, I suggest our audience unmute themselves and uh, why, uh, why don't you just, if you raise your hand and uh, if someone else isn't talking, in fact, you could just start talking. Alan, you want to get the ball rolling? I'll get the ball rolling. Thank you very much, uh, by the way, for, for the presentation. It's outstanding, uh, very informative. Uh, if I, I guess this is kind of a uh, uh, what, what, if anything, can be done about it question. Because we seem to be going back to recalls, we seem to be in a in a uh, an era right now, immediate and unending recalls, never ending re rollover recalls, I'll call them. Uh, and uh, you know, we've seen not uh, only like the governor attempting to be recalled, but also school board members and uh, city council members, of district. I think they started a recall against a district attorney in Los Angeles before he took office. Uh, and I know at Huntington Beach they appointed a uh, member, a new member of the city council, and they announced right there they were going to start a recall. Somebody had to tell them the law says you have to be in office 90 days before you can do that. And I also read, sorry for the long question, but I also read in, like in in, in Los Angeles, they trying to recall city council members, and when they can't get the signatures, okay, we'll just start again. Uh, so it's it's like. What can be done about this? This is, you know, this is this is a perversion to me. This is a perversion of democracy. This isn't democracy. What, if anything, do you think can be done about it? Oh, it's a great question because most of the recalls that do happen are prompted at the local level, right? They're they're usually against school board members. That's number one. And I think, as you point out, city council members also are. I think those are gaining steam. They're prompted by low signature thresholds. So one way, and I shouldn't say they're not entirely, uh, they, they vary from county to county, I believe. I have to look, I have to recall, I, I, I did some work on this a while back. Um, I, I shouldn't say they, the, the, the signature counts don't actually vary. The signature, sorry, the signatures typically are based on like 10% of the registered voters or 20% of those who cast a, a vote in the last election. They don't vary very much. They don't vary a lot from election to election, but they do vary among counties and among cities, uh, depending on whether you're a charter city or uh, you're just a general law city and, or, and the same thing with counties. So you can actually write your own rules if you're a charter county or charter city. Um, now, those rules can be strengthened or you could make it harder to collect signatures, for example. So you could say 40% uh, of the votes cast or instead of 20% of the votes cast, for example, or you could say uh, you, you only get a certain amount of time, you can shorten the window in which to collect signatures. And you can also um, make it so that, um, I, there are lots of different ways, right? That you can you can fiddle with those signature requirements and timelines, right? To make it more or less difficult for people to recall those in office. The problem, of course, politically is that when you do actually get someone, oh, sorry, one more thing. You could also, 
put a requirement, you could include a requirement, and this is also being considered for the gubernatorial elections, a uh, recall elections, uh, that the reason for the recall has to be for malfeasance or uh, alleged wrongdoing. Right now, we have some of the most permissive laws because they're based on the fact that anybody can be recalled for pretty much any reason. And so what is to stop someone from trying to get enough signatures to prompt a recall election when, in fact, you know, you just feel like, well, maybe we've tipped the scales in terms of registration. So now it's our chance and we can try to get someone out of there. That's what it sort of feels like in a lot of these local elections. But if you did base it on the reasons, uh, make the reasons a lot tougher. So it has to be for you know, alleged, mis not just alleged misconduct, but some kind of conduct that has been, you know, maybe identified by a grand jury or identified by a particular party, a person or group, that would also make it harder. So you would go about that, changing those at your local level, right? You'd have to actually do it at your local level. Um, and I do believe in state law, you could actually try to do it in state law. Um, and I don't actually know about the work these specific requirements, I believe, are in law, but uh, for, for general law cities and counties. But it's proposition, it's by proposition that we're going to have to change the recall because, you know, the recall itself is, um, you know, it was put in there by voters. So anything the voters put in there, they got to at least, if anything is initiated by, and I say initiated by initiative, if anything is actually prompted by an initiative, you have to go back to the initiative to change it. Okay, well, so that, that it sounds like w what you're saying is that uh, it, this it, we, we definitely have a difficult situation and it will not be easy to change it. It, it so, can be easier in some places, but yeah, it takes a lot of effort to change these laws. Right. Well, you know, we have that like with the Electoral College, too, or after the election, we we oh, yeah. moan and so forth. But then, in fact, uh, the situation remains. Uh, Jonathan has had his hand up patiently. Well, thank you. And um, Alan's question and, and your answer uh, really opens the, the door on the on the question uh, I wanted to ask. I, I will note that concerned citizens just one month ago, when we selected legislative action, it was reform the recall. And each of the points you may, just made are among the six that, that we listed, uh, including particularly the one about uh, specific grounds for a recall. Uh, right. Uh, there's a lot of energy in the legislature on this. There was a joint uh, uh, meeting of the Assembly and Senate Elections Committees with uh, okay. a lot of experts. I sat in on it by Zoom. And to prepare the proposal for our club, uh, I went to that wonderful source of data called Ballotpedia.com, Ballotpedia.com which has more data than you could uh, ever use. Uh, and I'm looking at a full page of that data. My question obviously can't go into very much, but the generalization is that uh, from 1911, when it was authorized, I guess in effect 1913, until yeah. it looks like 2009, um, the number, the total number of recalls per year was either zero, one, or uh, or two or three, and then it exploded so that in the first half of this last year there were fifty uh, recalls at all the levels. Alan mentioned um, some of them. Uh, every, every local official can be recalled, not just the governor, state legislators, etc. And it's exploded. It seems to have tracked the, the hyperpartisanship of the of the electorate generally, so that recalls seem to be just you know the next thing. If you lose an election, you immediately go to recall. So one of our proposals was a safe period for say a year after an election, a year before election, so recalls don't just take the place of elections. Right. Particularly with school boards, it's dramatic. The first half of this year, there were 23 school board recalls. Every other year before that, it was in single digits for the whole year. 
So that that's uh, so. My question really is: has, uh, Have the recalls become a function of hyperpartisanship and the uh, sure. effect of money uh, in the process? And just let me add a related question. There are some recalls that really need to be done because the city council people are crooks or somebody's a crook and they're pay for play. And there is probably a great deal more that are just uh, sour grapes. Uh, I lost, uh, so I'll go right to recall. So the, the reform has to make it possible for those local, local recalls that really ought to be done because the people are crooks who can't be convicted fast enough in the criminal process. Okay, that's mm -hmm. the end of a question. Thank you for listening and taking from here. Oh, it's no, that's that wonderful points, great points. Um, I would say that you're absolutely right. Hyperpartisanship is driving this kind of knee jerk reactions to uh, election outcomes and being because we're in a state where you have that tool. Well, once you've awakened to it, then it becomes a little more attractive, you know, and others can also learn from each other about how to use these to their to to good to their effect. Right. I wouldn't say to good effect, but um, they can continue to use them once that it's the Pandora, Pandora's box effect. Right. Once we know we can use it, why not? Um, so. <laughs> I would say it's also compounded by the fact that we have very, very great communication methods today. You know, I hate to say social media, but I mean, we can send messages lickety split and that the lightning fast uh, ways that we can s spread and disseminate messages and also mobilize people has changed so that, you know, if it, if it used to take snail mail and it used to take somebody outside a sitting outside you know, the, the local supermarket to gather signatures. Now you can send around petitions that people do have to print out, but and you can't do it online. You know, you still can't uh, sign anything online. Um, let's, you know, <laughs> hope we can't do that in the future because you want to, if you think it's bad now, that would make it really easy to, to prompt propositions and, and even more recalls. But I do think that, that what we're seeing, um, is, is really a function of those two things um, that we can pass around those things very quick. And also make, if you wanna have um, recall petition drive parties, which is what a, a lot of people ended up having last year. Uh, there were businesses, for example, in Riverside County where they just said, hey, we're having an open house, come sign the petition to recall the governor. And when you have those sorts of, you know, that kind of um, momentum that gather to gather signatures um, that can be, can be um, fomented through the passing around of messages easily, then why not? Right, well, I think uh, part of what we're also talking about is norms changing. So uh, mm -hmm. right. it, there, there are mechanisms, uh, perhaps the mechanisms are better, the, quicker than before, but it's also the case that, I mean, I'm a sociologist, so I would say that what people feel is appropriate behavior and their ability to learn quickly from one another, that sort of creates a context in which it's no longer considered odd to behave in ways that maybe 15 years ago would have been thought to be lunatic lunacy. Uh, Barbara, uh, I do want everyone to get a chance. We have, we have Thank about you. Seven, seven or eight minutes left. Would you like to answer? Okay. Um, I don't think I'll take very long. I, I loved the list you gave of all the legislation that was passed. I wanted to get up and just, you know, uh, um, um, you know, do a dance because um, I read about it piecemeal uh, in the LA Times. So that was a terrific and it really makes me proud to be a Californian. I spent 30 years in Florida. Oh, my God. I, I, I just have a couple of comments and then we'll end with a question that you didn't, a um, uh, couple of questions that you didn't um, focus on yet. Uh, and um, the first one was, it looks like with the redistricting um, in the um, in the in Congress, um, we could uh, lose three Democratic seats and two Republican seats, and in a nonpartisan, gleeful uh, wish list, Devin Nunes is in a competitive um, um, district now. Anyway, I just, what, pardon me? 
Possibly. Say that yes. again? Possib possible. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, well, she might move. I, I right? just, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or, <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I was so surprised to see that and not unhappy. Yeah. Um, but that's the only nonpartisan. Other than that, I'm nonpartisan. I was also surprised about the riding lawnmowers because I thought the leaf blowers, gasoline powered leaf blowers, were actually more polluting. Yes, but that was not bad. on the. Pardon me. They are. I think they're. I think they're included. I didn't include everything. Oh, was. okay. All right. You know, um, it's it that that's actually going to require some heavy changes around the state of California, which is going to cost some money. But let me um, let me ask you a, a question that. Um, that I was just reading about in the LA Times today and have a couple of times, and that's about adjuncts at universities. And it's a sore spot for me because I was one for a while and I know how they're treated. And I know, especially in the state of Florida, it was, you know, it was paupers wages. What's the impact at University of Redlands and how, what's the percentage of adjuncts who teach your freshman, sophomore classes? So could you get all that? Because my screen just froze. Yeah, yeah, I did. So one, it has to do with adjuncts and the other one has to do with competitive districts. And I will say that uh, it, it's, well, we're going to lose a seat in Congress anyway, right? So we're going from 53 to 52 and that's going to, that cause, it's a domino effect, right? It just causes all kinds of chaos. And that's why, uh, at least for incumbents, and they have to make some hard decisions about whether or not they're going to challenge their friends. And they really do have great, often great relationships with each other if they're from the same party. Right. So somebody's got to, somebody's got to either take the fall or they've got to, they've got to match up against each other. And in, in the case of Devin Nunes that you you point out, he is going to be districted in a in a way that is going to put him in a he's not going to get reelected unless he moves and he could just sort of you know hop over to the next district which he probably will do and that's all oh, really red so oh, yeah I mean oh, you, yeah you can just sort of like oh I'm going to just move over to that next one where I'm going to have a better chance so we may not see that we, we may not have seen the you know that the last of, of Devin Nunes because his problem <laughs> not to keep going yeah and he's you know he's made a name for himself so it's probable that his you know the people in the next district over might welcome him so but you're right um some of the de the Democrats who are being redistricted I mean it, it, there are a couple of Republicans. I mean, as far as I can tell, uh, Daryl Issa, who's in my area, he's going to be now in a much bluer district. A couple are going to be, uh, Michelle Steele's is also getting bluer. And then uh, Mike Garcia is getting bluer. Then, of course, somebody like Katie Porter, she actually is only, it's, it's, it is redder, but it, right now it's a plus two Republican district. So it's, it, it is red, but I, I don't know. I, I tend to think that journalists are making a bigger deal about it hmm. than necessary. I mean, it, some of that's going to, it really just depends on how the no, non-partisans will turn out in, the, in those cases, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you're still going to get the no party preference voters and depending on how they break, she could still be reelected. So it's, I don't, wouldn't say that she's necessarily gone and she may be able to put up a big fight and, and, and maintain her seat. Or retain it so so we'll see um but I, from what i understand it looks like there are 39 democratic leaning there are seven republican leaning and then six that are highly competitive right right that's what i read in cal cal matters yeah right yeah yeah that's that's the way they've put it so yeah we'll see. yeah we'll see and then in the adjuncts that's a really yeah that there, there was a law that was passed just it went into effect just a couple of years ago and the labor unions worked closely with the legislature to ensure that adjuncts were being paid a minimum basically minimum wage and so i believe they tied it uh to they tied it to minimum wage and cal did a calculation basically and said if you work uh as an adjunct you have to be paid this floor and so it's it's something around like forty five hundred dollars a class or something like that now um and you know honestly yeah, it's charity wages or it has been charity wages until that law went into effect. It was just absolutely just a pittance. And I will say that it had a huge effect on Redlands because we're private. We only have about right, 2,500 yeah. undergraduates. And so, I, you know, I think in the first year, year, it cost us almost, I think, I want to say in the neighborhood of like a half a million dollars or something. I mean, it was like, or in the year, that first year, um, I could be wrong about it, but 
Gosh, I don't want to. What portion <laughs> of your faculty are adjuncts at, at University of Redlands? Yeah, well, I, I we don't have a huge number at the undergraduate level um, because that's not how we build our our right, particular. right, yeah. But uh, and it and it's gotten really hard. I mean, we do have some in my department, for example. We're having a really tough year because no one could come to campus last year and check us right. out. And uh -huh. no, it's really hard to recruit students. So we have a very small incoming freshman class, um, hoping to rebuild over the next couple of years. And so our adjunct budget was slashed. Um, and we're just taking on more students, you know, as, as regular full-time faculty members. Okay. I don't have a number for you in terms of how many adjuncts we have. Um, typically they are teaching introductory level classes. Um, but in my case, for example, uh, I, I teach one of the introductory level classes. I teach intro to American politics, but I also teach U.S. Congress and that's, they're in the middle of a simulation right now. They're having a lot of fun. <laughs> um, yeah, it was interesting because yeah. the LA Times has been, been doing several stories on it. So, but thank you. Yeah, it's, it's actually hit a lot of, of campuses hard, um, but I think justified. It, it's a, it was well, it was needed because those wages really were too low, in my opinion, having been an adjunct in my life as well. I mean, I, I, I can attest <laughs> that for sure. <laughs> yeah. Organize. Yeah. I'm yeah. afraid we're, we're yeah. about out, out of time. Okay. So, I'm afraid we're about we're about out of time. So I'm I'm uh, I'm going to have to uh, bring in my my conclusion. All right. So, uh, concerned citizens, thanks, Professor Van Vechten, for helping us to understand the complex political institutions in our state. <clears throat> and concerned citizens, thanks you, our viewers, for joining us for another insightful program. As 2021 draws to a close, Concerned Citizens has begun meeting in person. If we continue to do so, Concerned Citizens Presents will undergo a change in format. While keeping the occasional remote speaker, most of our presentations will be rebroadcasts of our in-person speakers. Yet it is too early to know what 2022 will bring. Should the virus threat increase, concerned citizens will discontinue in-person meetings and concerned citizens presents will again feature remote speakers. In these days of uncertainty, all I can say is this, for the latest information on our upcoming programs, watch our newsletter, the globe and our emails. And to be absolutely sure you get a heads up, make sure to pay your 2022 dues.